soldiers who came looking for weapons hidden in people's house. About five soldiers broke into our house and ordered us to uncover any hidden weapons. I only escaped death when one of the soldiers spared my life and that of those I was with after recognizing me as a total from Rayon Spore when he found a photo of album while searching my house. From April 8th to 29th, I spent my time between the house of my football club teammates and that of my football club board member who also came to my rescue when things got worse. On April 9th, roadblocks were set up in Chigari in the surrounding area. And on April 18th, I experienced the first personal attack by an Italian militia. Then, early in the morning of 26th April, three young militias armed with guns, grenades and machetes, came looking for me. Apparently they have been ordered to come and take me. I was ordered to follow them, which I refused to do. And it was during that moment when I was hit on the, on the head and injured. Luckily, my teammate's soldier cousin, who had spent a night at the house, came to my rescue when he ordered them to leave me alone. After this attack, my teammate, Munyurangabo, advised me to seek refuge at the house of my football club's fan, who happened to be one of the readers of the Nihirama militia group. I came from a family of 14 children. But when the genocide started in, in 94, only two of us lived in Rwanda with my parents. My other sibling lived in exile, in Burundi, in Congo, in Belgium and Canada because of the persecution and discrimination that has been going on for many years. I think we saw it from the beginning in 59, 73. So many in 73, most of my brothers and sisters left to Rwanda. I lost so many of my extended family, cousins and uncles. And my best friend, Jacqueline, Mediatrice, Gahid, Pasca. So many that sometimes when I, I go back to Rwanda, I. I just can't take it, to think that I, I can't find my best friend. But another miracle happened on the morning of the 13th of April. I was called by the priest to come and meet someone. I was so scared because I thought certainly someone wants to kill me. I was a girl guy that was a very involved with women and all that. I thought maybe someone knows about men want to kill me. But I went out of the house and went out. And I saw who? I saw my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law was a Belgian son. As I told you at the beginning, many of my relatives, my sisters lived abroad, and one of them lived in Belgium, and she married a soldier. We always tell her this is the best thing she's done in her life. <laughs> <laughs> to marry, how can, did she marry a Belgian soldier? <laughs> so that guy had managed to be part of the the, the, the soldier Belgian who came to Rwanda to rescue Belgian and expatriate. They were not allowed to rescue Rwandese. But when I saw him, you know, it's like seeing God himself. I couldn't believe he was there. He was with a few other Belgian soldiers. So he said, I'm coming to pick you up. We were taken to with many other Belgian 
uh, people and few Rwandis to the airport. We spent the night there and after we were taken to Nairobi, when we stayed again two nights in a uh, military airport with a lot of expatriates. And two days after, we were allowed to go to Belgium by a, a military flight without a passport, without anything, but we did not care. We were alive and we did not even know much what was happening. So we were so lucky to go to Belgium. My sister, which had two children, my dad, my mom, one nephew and one niece. Do you imagine that one Belgian soldier with few others rescued us? So since then, when I went to Belgium, I was so upset, so upset with the international community. As Eric said, they were there, the peacekeepers, but they were not allowed to rescue one day. So I, for me, that was my first lesson, my first thinking to think, how can we be abandoned like animals? Yesterday I was talking to the excellent engineer. Even animals sometimes are rescued. How can they? They were there, but they were not around. For me, that anger, I, I still have it a little bit. Because I still see what's sort of happened in many other countries. I still see what happened in South Sudan or whatever. I still think, can we find a way of really acting quickly? Yeah, I will go subject. But I was also very upset with my own people. Because I, I, I used to think, yes, there was so many propaganda, there was radio in Korean, there was this and that, but we are human beings first. How can they do? Because what they did was beyond what you can do. One of my cousins was raped by 10 soldiers. My best friend was killed in a way I can't explain it to you. So I was very upset with human beings, but mainly Catholics. Because we were, many people were killed in Catholic church, but people who used to attend masses every Sunday, we, you know, they were killed by them. Those people, Rwanda was a 95% Catholic country. And people were very, very committed. They used to go to the church every Sunday. And after that, they killed each other in those same churches. Yeah. <laughs>
whatever it takes. Number 10. I think the events of 1994 and the genocide have a particular resonance. Uh, maybe perhaps even in this month, where not only do we celebrate Holocaust Memorial Day later this month, but around the same time, uh, the anniversary of the birth of our great Scottish poet Robert Burns, who spoke of man's inhumanity to man. And for my generation who grew up learning and being reminded about the Holocaust and the Second World War, and who as adults experienced close at hand in Europe the evils of Srebrenica and other uh, massacres during the, uh, the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Uh, it is hard to imagine what happened in, in, even then in Rwanda where not only were between 800,000 and a million people killed in 100 days, but they were not killed using air instruments of mass murder. They were not killed by napalm bombs covering areas in hours with hundreds, perhaps thousands of people dying as a result. Not, not uh, killed by large gas chambers crowded together and killed by a chemical mechanism. Or even by machine guns in large groups as, as happened uh, in other parts of Europe. But killed one-to-one -one combat by by hand, by club, by knife, by machete. And I think it is really, really hard to understand the, the horrors of that situation unless you were there at the time. And that's why the testimony of Eric and the songs of Jean Paul and others are so important for us that we learn to understand through the, the words and the songs of those who, who know more just what that may indeed have felt like. We know how difficult it is to rebuild uh, from identity-based conflict. It's, it's 15 years since the so-called final peace agreement was signed in Northern Ireland. And there were bombs on the streets of Northern Ireland last month and there are still disputes about basic issues of parades and identity and flags. For decades, conflicts between Israel and Palestine and even some parts of the Indian subcontinent, the Balkans and the Caucasus, these conflicts, identity-based tensions, threats, um, go on today as they have done for decades and elsewhere in Africa too. But I think in Rwanda there is a positive story to tell and it's important this year that we remember what happened and particularly the younger generation is reminded of the facts to learn and to help them ensure that these horrors are never experienced again. But it's also important to remember how possible it is when a nation is determined and when a people is determined uh, it is possible to rebuild. During the Holocaust and during the genocides that have happened since then, communities, whether in school or in neighbourhoods, have been actively divided, with people encouraged to turn on their neighbours, on other members of their community, to isolate and persecute them, to betray them. To achieve their aims, perpetrators first divide neighbourhoods and communities. Holocaust Memorial Day was set up to mark not only the Holocaust, but also all victims of Nazi persecution and all those who have suffered in the genocides that have taken place subsequently in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur. Because the lessons of the Holocaust have not been learned and genocide has taken place again and again I represent the charity, the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, which was set up by the government to support and promote Holocaust <coughs> Memorial Day. This year, there will be well over 2,000 events taking place in local communities right across the UK, in libraries, in prisons, in cinemas, in schools, and more. People will gather to learn about the past and think what they can do to ensure that the lessons are not forgotten. And even more than this, what they can do to increase bonds between neighbours and take steps to create a safer and a better future. <clears throat> Today is a significant day. Today marks the launch of commemorations which will take place over the next few months to mark the 20th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda. Every year, Holocaust Memorial Day reminds people of the genocide in Rwanda, and this year we've produced more resources and are encouraging more people 
to highlight this important anniversary. My friends, the motto for Proboco 20 is a wise and powerful one. We must first all look back and remember where we have come from. Only then can we make links with others and unite and choose the right path to head. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. Oh, 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 oh,